Welcome to The Truth in This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. And today, today's a long time coming. Today is a treat. Uh, I originally was going to do this interview a little while ago. And uh, in the, the conversation leading into it, learned that the guest and I share a birthday. So we're doing it today um, and putting it out because we're, you know, both Aquarians. Um, so today's guest is a Dutch artist celebrated for her captivating figurative paintings and exploration of new contemporary realism, unveiling the complexities of archetypal female figures within the male-dominated infrastructure. Please extend a warm welcome to the talented and visionary Martine Johanna. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Rob. How are you doing? It's so good to talk to you. I don't think I'm royalty, but it's fine, yeah? <laughs> I mean, all of us, January 20th, we have crowns on our heads, you know. That's if, true. If it's not visual, we, it's there. It exists. Um, yeah. And, you know, like I, like I was saying in the, the intro, that um, I've, I've been looking forward to this. this is a long time coming, so I'm really just, you know, excited to be able to chat. And it's it's very timely. Um, you you hit me up and you're like, look, I got some new work coming. So I'm like, okay, uh -huh. cool. So um, to start off, I always like to get the the root, the the beginning of the story, or what have you. Um, so for you, you know, take us back to the early on, the very beginning, some of those early experiences with art, whether it was from the creating art or whether it was from the appreciating art. But, you know, talk, talk a bit about some of those early roots and those early foundational moments. Yeah. So really, really early, I think drawing was always an escape for me. Uh, I grew up in a very religious community. And um, I remember that uh, one day in school, I was, you know, I, I think I was about 11 or something. And then my teacher, who was also a preacher, which rhymes really nicely, by the way. But uh, <laughs> he told uh, me I was drawing a horse with wings and like a unicorn. And he told me, like, this is not of God. God hasn't created this creature. And he showed the whole classroom and he hung it up in the classroom, like in front of the classroom with that sort of story, like, this is not from God. You shouldn't draw something that God hasn't created. And all I could think was, oh, I have my first exhibition. <laughs> 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 I was like so proud and happy that he hung that in the classroom. Uh, I don't think that was necessarily what he meant to do, but I really liked it. <laughs> and uh, I remember also when uh, people were asked in the classroom, like, what do you want to become later when you grow up? Um, everybody would say like, oh, I want to be a nurse or a firefighter. I think that's universal, right? I mean, in America, that's the same, more or less. And then I was, I asked my mom, like, what's it called when you make a living out of drawing? And then she said, then you're an illustrator. So I remembered that. <laughs> and that's what I said in that questionnaire, like uh, the question round. And I said, I want to be an illustrator. And then later I found out what art was. Yeah. So uh, I saw paintings, uh, you know, when we went to a castle because I live in, a, in an area where there are a lot of Dutch castles still from uh, med medieval castles and stuff. It's very romantic. And uh, I saw paintings and I was like, oh, I want to paint. And then I saw a picture of the Mona Lisa and I, I uh, tried to copy that when I was about 15. And I did it in watercolor and I liked it so much. And then I started to paint Monet and Manet and all the expressionists. I tried to copy those. And I wanted to be an artist because it felt like every time I would draw and, and paint and I still have that, I would go to this sort of alternate alternate universe yeah. where everything is nice and peaceful and dreamy and like, I love the idea of endless possibility. And I think that is really what draws me into art is the possibility, not the things that are not possible, because that's what I heard all around me when I was small and all the things that you couldn't do when you're a woman or a girl. Um, 
because uh, then you know uh, there are other priorities like you have to marry somebody and uh, get uh, and have children and be a housewife or um or you choose a career that you can make money of and be responsible there was a lot of like the word responsible in the, <laughs> when i grew up uh so i did one uh i i was allowed to go to the arts academy mm -hmm. just to stick to the work uh, side and uh but not the free arts although i want to do it like painting and drawing uh, my mother said like you can do it but only if you study fashion because in fashion you can make money <laughs> <laughs> which is absolutely not true <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> but I thought like yeah hell why not you know because I also liked uh, fashion design and uh, clothes and I love clothes so much so uh, uh, I was like yeah fine so I went there and I had a talk with uh, like six teachers there was a whole panel and they all tried to convince me to go to the free arts and then I said, no, because I'm not allowed <laughs> from, from my parents. So I did fashion and I really liked fashion as well. Um, and then there was sort of a hiatus. So I, I was a fashion designer for, uh, I think, 10 years or so. But it felt really confining. This is like a real quick overview of how I oh, started. <laughs> And then uh, when I started living in Amsterdam, I had my own little apartment and I went on the streets and I met new friends and we would go and do street art and I would freeze my fingers off trying to handle a spray can. <laughs> I wasn't like, I, I, yeah, I, I wasn't built for that. And, uh, <laughs> uh, um, and uh, yeah, I, I just did all these kind of things like murals and 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 stickers, really ugly stickers also, and uh, but I had so much fun. And at one point, I was asked to do an exhibition with uh, uh, street artists, and from one one thing led to another, and I just quit my fashion design job at one point because I could live like exactly from selling one painting <laughs> per month <laughs> and i could pay my rent and have something to eat and be happy and that was all that i needed so yeah well thank you um and, and definitely i want to i want to comment on that before i go into this next question you know especially that that last part like i've always kind of lived this dual lifestyle because of that sort of you know you have an artistic goal you want to do something creative i, I wanted to be yeah. a you know illustrator or comic book artist and all of that stuff when i was younger and you know always had sort of this interest in all of these creative things but knowing that and, and being you know sort of told that you got to do something that's going to make money because your feet mm -hmm. are big and shoes are expensive you know <laughs> and so mm -hmm. having having that as a thing and you know, I still do that now, but looking for ways to to better marry the two to. Yeah. But I definitely romanticize sort of the artistic lifestyle. But, you know, as I you know get closer to, to 40 or as I get older, I guess that is is not something for the now. That was something in the past. And that experience was great. And, you know, I, I'll say that in. I would always have these contractual jobs at colleges. So being around sort of the younger folks or what have you that are seeing things and trying different things. So being yeah. around that, that energy exists, but then also having a very busy like social schedule, a very busy podcasting schedule, it just felt yeah. like I'm not on a calendar. I'm not on a clock. Um, I'm on my own time. And that's the thing yeah. that I think I like about at least the, the pieces of the sort of artistic life. And I was hearing bits of that in, in, in your, you know, description of, yeah, I did street art for a while and I was doing this and fashion. Nah, not so much. I, <laughs> I did that. Um, so it, it brings me to this question of how, how does in your, your current work or your, you know, more recent work, how does, you know, illustration drawing now, I mean, in fashion, it, it, whether it is the thinking behind it, whether it is the sort of application or the techniques, how does that show up in your work these days? Oh yeah, it's a yeah, it's a really nice question. I, I want to first uh, go, go back to something you said just now. 
sure. Uh, if I can remember it, by the way, because <laughs> I, I have got, uh, uh, issues with my concentration because I have ADD, but like really diagnosed ADD. Uh, but, um, oh, no, I forgot it. Oh, I, I'll remember it later. Um, yeah, so the fashion influence, I think all creative professions are related. Um, so it's all language, right? I mean, when you go into painting or drawing, it's a language, uh, different from words. It's like everything except words that you're saying, just like music, right? Mm -hmm. Music is also a language or dance is a language, but fashion is also a language. I mean, when I say streetwear, you have an image of what that is. Or when you say red carpet, you have an image of what that is, or, you know, a, a classic costume or, I, and those are like really broad terms. So I think the expression is all related. And also fashion has this sort of language when you wear it. The only thing is that it has to, it has a restriction, which is the body. Mm. Just like illustration has a restriction that it has to convey the story that you're illustrating, for instance, right? Um, so uh, I don't like restrictions, so <laughs> I'm much more happy to have fashion influence in my work now because now it's like a choice of expression only and it doesn't need to fit a wearer or has no practical use. Mm -hmm. So it's expression only. And in that sense, I use it more as an abstract uh, a shape language, like form language. So I have a lot of pleats, for instance, in my work, pleats or like uh, moving fabrics that are almost symbolic for a whirlwind or uh, it's very uh, constraining or it's, you know, it communicates something, right? Mm -hmm. So it communicates in one of the paintings, it, it communicates communicates a sort of wildness and entanglement, for instance. And when I say entangled and clothes, you also immediately have an image, right? Yeah. So I think all these uh, expressions, I mean, uh, leave out language for now, but all these expressions are uh, a creative expression from our being that is unique to our species. You, you know, if you don't count elephants that draw because we gave them, uh, you know, paint and a brush, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and also language. And if I add language to it, you know, rhyming or poetry, uh, I love the dynamics of language as well. So I also play with that in some, uh, projects. I've made a book that with drawings and, and also a sort of a very strangely strangely uh, formed story that is in the past the present and the future but it's all combined yeah because i like to play with not reality <laughs> <laughs> it's all uh, over in my work like the the sort of escapism to something else than we are now yeah uh, yeah and i also i remember now <laughs> What I want to go into, because uh, you said, like, um, you know, when I talk so enthusiastically about my starting periods, when I uh, I started as an artist, I, I talked about it with my uh, friends the other day that um, the older you get, the less room you have ahead of you. So the time you spend feels more urgent. And when you're younger, you don't feel the urgency yet. I mean, the urgency comes like after your 30s, then you feel like, oh, I don't have that much time anymore. So yeah. the time you have ahead of you grows shorter and the time behind you goes bigger. I think this is something that's really ni not nice to hear for young people, but that's what happens. So you have to really invest in what you really like when you're younger. So you can, you know, uh, build on that when you get older. So don't put off anything. I think if you have ambitions or feelings or love for something you want to do, you have to try and do it while you can. So you can, you know, sit back a little bit more when you get older and enjoy that, the choices that you made. 
That's a, that's a, that's a really good point because like, and this is now, now I'm free jazzing now. That's a really good point where, you know, when you talk about ambition, you know, when I do this, um, I doing this podcast at one point, there was a year when I put out 330 episodes and, yeah. you know, why'd you do so many? I was like, because I enjoy doing it. Well, that's too many. It's like, who, who's saying that? I'm the one that's doing it. And yeah. Or why do you talk to these people? It, it's sort of like I and, and this this will be great because, you know, Aquarius is I'm riding a wave, a creative wave. I call it the creative Holy Ghost. And yeah. when it strikes, I just have to do it. And while I, I like hearing feedback from people of what they take what I'm doing as or what this might mean and what this might represent, all of that stuff. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. It, it's It's what I'm interested in. And, you know, if someone likes it, great, you get it. But if you don't, that's also great. It's not for you. And I think a big piece of my my style is indicative of that. And, you know, I, I think, you know, you and I are very similar in this this sort of way where I think from what I gathered and listening to interviews and, you know, I was chatting beforehand, you're a free thinker. You're, yeah. you're not huge on the administrative parts of like, huh, really? I got oh. this out? Um, <laughs> and you're a bit of a rebel. I see it. I, I see the hair. I, I, you're a bit of a rebel. I see it. I, I dig it. Uh, so tell me about how like that shows up in how you 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 approach your work, um, whether it is thematically in the themes that you're pursuing, whether it yeah. is in sort of what you're exploring or even in, you know, sort of what relationships with with galleries that you're even pursuing. Tell me about sort of like you as the person, how that like shows up in your work. Yeah. So what I feel is like even if you're talking about podcasts, for instance, I think every conversation is valuable, even like if your conversation is not that great, it's also a valuable thing because it's an experience, you know, you learn from it. And I think uh, also that's how I stand in life more or less. I'm very open also to criticism or to like really uh, build up cr criticism, like with reasoning, not with judgment only, because <laughs> that's not criticism to me. I think that's a weakness if people do that. Um, uh, I think it's just I, being open to everything and learning and uh, don't restrict other people's thinking. As long as you don't harm each other, I think every, everything can come into question, except that I really trust science. <laughs> but even scientists, like good scientists, they uh, keep on questioning and researching because that's what science is, you know, is that you research and you try to learn something new and then you find out maybe you made a little error and then you research further and you go deeper. I really like to know everything about everything. I want to understand people. I want to understand how systems work and how, you know, uh, all these influences work and, and, I, I I really love people. I hate how they behave sometimes, but I really love people and characters and just different views and stories. And I think that's so special about us people that we have so many stories to tell. And sometimes they're really interesting, sometimes a little bit boring, but that's also really nice, you know? <laughs> so it's, uh, I don't know. I just feel really invigorated when I I have this sort of, expand to possibilities and i think that also people that i work with like gallerists or they feel that enthusiasm and uh they feel that i'm really invested in doing better myself trying to be open to do i make mistakes or do i can i do something different or uh am i nice enough to somebody else like am i um you know, uh, am I developing myself? Because uh, I can be really hard on myself. Uh, uh, and and at the same time, I'm always very scared to make mistakes, you know, uh, or to be, um, uh, how do you say? Um, uh, um, uh, sometimes I struggle with my English. 
when somebody says no or like your yeah how do you say that when somebody says I, like, I'm not, <laughs> yeah like rejects you yeah rejection. like i'm very scared of rejection sometimes yeah. and uh but i also when i get that then i feel like uh, oh but i survived this like it's not that bad as i thought you know it, <laughs> so it, yeah it, it's it's one of those things, and 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 I didn't mean to you know really cut you off. But I wanted to at least mention this, where I again it's it's the same. It's it's the same in going through through this sort of process, and I had to understand like and accept it. You know where you know you're going through, and it definitely I want to get your take on this. You're going through, and you're overly manicuring. Like imagine you know we do a conversation, right? And mm -hmm. I'm looking for every um, every gap, all of this stuff and looking mm -hmm. for that thing that feels more perfect. It's yeah. it removes it from what it actually is. It's a conversation. Conversations have those ums in it. It has those gaps, it has those pauses. And, you know, if there are things that should come out because it's like in poor taste or the person's like, no, this is still going to be going out, then we should probably remove this piece of it. That makes sense. It may not fit contextually, um, yeah. but what feels like a conversation that's what the aim is and yeah. you know i i get caught on a rejection thing too where or even sort of what i feel is rejection i might put out an episode and it's like damn two downloads guess i'm done guys you know <laughs> and then there are other times where it's wow this went really well but my thing is it's, it's this it's, it's the actual yeah. connection with the person i'm yeah. not here to be a podcaster to do this. I'm, I'm here and this is going to sound so pretentious. And I feel almost hate myself for saying it, but it's, it's really about connecting with people. It's really about building sort of relationships. Um, you know, you, you touched on like friendship as a theme. I've, I heard that a lot in what you were saying here, what you were saying in previous podcasts. And yeah. I'm always curious about how friendships maintain and how they develop when it comes to, you know, this world with social media, with artists and being in it. Because yeah. I felt like maybe I'm friends with people, but turns out maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not really. Oh, I've had the same. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've had the same. Yeah, no, it's true. But also, I think the anxiousness or being rejected, I, I think everybody has it. And I think the the, mo the people that say they don't have it at all have it the most. Mm. And uh, like Elon Musk. Or Trump. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to mention them, but <laughs> no, well, well, Trump. No. <laughs> one of the reasons this podcast started because I was like, "Screw this dude." Here's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think people should talk more with each other and, and shout less because if you shout too much, you don't, you're not communicating. I think communication. I think mean, communication is key. It sounds so corny, but it's true. You know. <laughs> We all should be able to speak with one another and try to understand. I think that's too much uh, of a split going on everywhere. Yes, give me the space to be wrong. Give me the space to grow. And even in it, it's curiosity, too, of I wonder what these people think. And I, I you know, I, I'll say this before I move into this, this next question I want to ask you. Um, uh, it is... I was in a meeting yesterday and we were talking about sort of racial biases here. Yeah. And yeah. I was hearing from another person of color that they don't exist. And that's specifically black people. The call is majority black people. This person was not black, uh, yeah. said that I just think black people are victims and they're just choosing to be victims. It derailed the call. <laughs> people were losing their minds. It yeah. rightfully so. And and yeah. the, the person was very defensive about their position and really it derailed it because it wasn't like a discourse. We were, you know, the people on the call were giving her sort of that space to be wrong. Maybe she, you know, English is not her first language, so maybe she misinterpreted. It's like, no, no, no. She spoke very eloquently about her ignorance. And, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's it's sort of that thing. And I, I think you know, people at their root, they they want to be able to have common ground with folks and be able to connect with folks. Yeah. But we get too affixed to sort of a belief system. And yeah. it's like what drives that belief system. And yeah. again, going back to this this notion of perfection, right? Um, 
that's I think that's the thing. I never want to be wrong. I always want to be right. So yeah. for for you with with sort of the, the things you touched on, sort of the rejection thing, sort of being very very hard and very critical of yourself at times. I'm like I said, I'm the same way. We're on the same page. So, so uh, yeah. what are your thoughts on like perfect or imperfect work? Yeah. I think I think that is a thing. You can't really put your finger on it. Mm. And because you can't, it's it's like an unobtainable ideal. It's like utopia, and utopia can is only utopia because it's n something you never will get. <laughs> it's the impossible thing to strive for because you have your talent and you have your practice, and those combined will give you your best at that time, and you can strive for something better, and it will make you grow. But it never goes as fast as you would like to uh, it to go. Yeah. But it's. I think that's not a bad thing because I think growth takes time. It's the same like if you get money tomorrow, like a million dollars, you'll uh, you will be able to buy anything you want almost. Yeah. Uh, say ten million. <laughs> 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 but then you're not grateful anymore. Right. So well, I think the experiences are so much more worth than uh, than having the perfection. Perfection mm. is something you can strive for. I mean, that's my sensible uh, side that's talking now. Uh, but I know that I'm harsh on myself because I know that because of what I've been through as a child already and later on also as a woman. Uh, you know, I had a difficult relationship with my mom and uh, she had high expectations of me and we had a very strained relationship. There was a little bit of violence in the house and uh, some neglect on some part. And on the other side, I really loved her and she's sort of amused also. It's really complicated, mothers and daughters stuff. Yeah. But I've also been sexually assaulted when I was smaller and also when I was older a couple of times. And then, you know, you your self-worth takes a hit. And I think that's also when you said about uh, uh, black, black pe people like that, that was it a lady that said it? I said yes, lady. It was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said lady. <laughs> <laughs> like we're in Mississippi. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the, um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's like sometimes men say it about women, you know, that they're always playing the victim. I mean, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be a woman of color, because that must be even harder in life. Uh, but I know how it is to be a woman and not have freedom always because people take advantage of being stronger, you know and you're isolated so uh um yeah in that sense i think you know the self-worth thing plays into uh, also when i work and how harsh i am on myself it has to be you know it has the roots in uh, being seen as something that's not worth mm. something yeah I, I i hear you um and thank you for for sharing. I mean, it's it's you know we have these these real conversations, and you know at times when something that's real and it's something that plays a role in sort of the thinking that goes into the work or how we approach our work or whatever it might be. Yeah. You know, sometimes people want the really clean and sanitized answers. Like, no, here's the real answer. And I had this idea because you know as Aquarius is we're fake philosophers. Um, I had this this notion of I call it like perceived deficits and however you maybe perceive yeah. yourself or you know you maybe act in accordance to so like here and i would imagine yeah. different parts but like here you know if you're of a certain size for sake of argument like mm -hmm. six four probably like 280 something but i was 350 not long ago and yeah you know you you, it, you hear these things of oh you're lazy because you're, you're overweight yeah. You're this because you're so you work harder than the other person and you're already yeah. working hard and it, it's some of those things as like having like a fat guy mentality um yeah. you know just wanting to really show that 
your worth, your the quality of what you do, how you go about what you do. And that extends yeah. in the professional realm, that extends extends in the professional and art realm, but it extends on how we view ourselves and all of that stuff is baked in. So yeah. Yeah. And, or even this, this notion where I've heard at times because I am who I am, I can only be who I am. Right. Yeah. And I've yeah. had folks say, why do you talk to these white artists? Why do you talk to these artists from other places? You should be talking to the black artists. And I was just like, I talk to whoever I find interesting. I don't think that's black enough. I was like, didn't ask you. And, <laughs> but it's no, sort it's of, a, this, yeah. It's how skin deep. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, yeah. and it's something where, it's other people's perspective on what and how you should exist. And it extends into what your contribution is to the canon that you're working in. You know, yeah. like, well, I think your work should be about this. I've had so many people hit me up in DMs and I want to almost screenshot them to be, but to hit me up in DMs, you should ask these types of questions as a bah, 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 and yeah, it's yeah. identity component to it. And yeah, I don't know. It's, very, very I, odd. <laughs> I, I do understand it, though, because, you know, I I understand it from a historical perspective also and, and from a current perspective still. Um, uh, but I always think it's interesting to talk to anybody. So that's the only difference. But I don't come from a group that's, uh, you know, considered a minority, except that I'm a woman. <laughs> Uh, and so that's also, and I don't like the word minority at all. I just think equality, even though we're not there yet, I would l really love that everybody would think like that because it would make such a difference. And unfortunately it's not. So I do, I do understand the sort of feeling for, you know, being seen and heard. Yeah. People who say they want you to ask questions on black artists, for instance, because they need more of a stage, maybe, you know, uh, I feel that also for women artists uh, somehow. I mean, that's still a difference, but um, I don't know. I understand it, that people want that because it's I don't think it's a victim mentality. Also, I don't think so. I think it's just natural. You know that it's always the same people that get the chances mm -hmm. and um i uh yeah no i really understand it that's why it's important to have that independence to be able to do what you want and how you want and let that show it so i you know, and what I do, it's all baked in. I try not to do the performative thing of this month, we're only going to talk with queer artists or this month, only artists of color. It's just yeah. like, look, it's all baked in yeah. out this sort of body of work. And in speaking of, of bodies of work, I must transition into this upcoming yeah. exhibit. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. I want to <laughs> see that was my attempt to really hard left transition. Um, yeah. But I, I want to talk about a particular ghost. Um, is set to debut soon. Let's let's talk about yeah. it. Um, yeah. Could you share a bit about the um, overall inspiration and concept behind the collection? I mean, I got my yeah. preview that I'm going to keep close to the vest. But um, yeah. you know, I, I really it was a great surprise to to get the visuals um, yesterday. So definitely want to talk a bit about that. So please tell us, share with us. Yeah, so a particular ghost already says, like, it's a specific, it's almost like a specific thought, but an, maybe a negative one or something that haunts me. And because uh, I've been in, in therapy, because I'm already, uh, you know, uh, being uh, open about everything. I was in th therapy for um, uh, PTSD, for ext extended PTSD, so... Uh, I've had uh, uh, EMDR sessions and uh, other sessions to cope with trauma um, and it was long overdue <laughs> but then I, I thought like oh I have all these ghosts in my head because I still suffer from noise in my head where I get like really a lot of voices not it's not like I'm, I'm I'm not mentally ill in that way but I just have sounds in my head and it's like a stress symptom 
And sometimes they get louder and I get all these sort of entangled thoughts and um, I don't know. And somehow painting also helps me cope with them. And I wanted to make something really different this time. So I thought, uh, let's just pluck those thoughts out of my head. And I have these really sort of almost horror-like dreams sometimes where I'm at places where I'm all alone. And uh, then I thought, like, why don't I paint places that I see in my dreams? So uh, this might be new to people who know my work, but I've painted a couple of landscapes this time. And uh, they're sort of enclosed in abstract forms, almost like my brain <laughs> shapes. <laughs> and um, uh, they're like little views into my dream world where it's like desolate, like nobody's there, but it's in forests. And it's really a little bit like the place where I grew up, where there are a lot of trees and nature. And but it still feels quite confined because my youth was sort of like that. It was very romantic in the sense of nature and, you know, castles around and like a girl, you know, you're like, oh, princess, I'm a princess. I'm a secret princess. Everybody, <laughs> every girl thinks that when they're young. And, uh, and the other uh, the other side, there were a lot of churches and there was a lot of like uh, restriction and judgment and I've uh I I used to fight a lot when I was uh, small and 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 uh fight, like stood up for myself literally against groups of boys I don't know where I got the guts from but I always fought for myself anyway but uh, <laughs> uh and I somehow that feeling of that enclosement and sort of the sort of drive to hide but also drive to stand up for myself or to expose myself and and be free to do that that's all in the show yeah. so it it goes from desolate sort of enclosed uh scenes and forests with like buildings or um it, it goes into like um, yeah pornography Almost like two pornography images. I got questions screen. about those. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and uh, they are super exposed. And, and I did those because they made me feel uncomfortable. And that's why I did them. Because, yeah, that that was something I also challenged. Like I had a lot of my mind I just wanted to put out. So and uh, so it's a lot of experiment and taking chances because people are always used to what you make. And they expect that you make more of that. So I did something different this time a little bit. And it's very uh, scary. <laughs> but oh. I felt like I had to have the particular ghost out of my mind and onto paintings and drawings. Yeah. Scary is good. What, what was the, the sort of like when the initial sort of moment like you worked on, let's say, the the first piece into when you're like all right i think this is the full body what was that sort of time frame <laughs> yeah so i started with the two pornography images <laughs> months ago and i <laughs> and they are large like they're, no, they're not that large like they're almost as tall as me and uh, uh but i i had to make them i was like i want to show like a woman that is uh excited you know like uh, uh like in heat and that has her own uh desires because you're never shown that it's always like men like everywhere there's like totem poles and like everywhere things are erect but women you hardly see <laughs> very excited unless it's porn you know That's so true. and then everything like uh and also women are always judged for being exposed because then you're like a hoe or a slut or and but for men there are no words like that there are no words for men that are judgmental about uh, you know being sexually active then you're a hero you know so and i wanted to counteract that but the the what happened and i hope that everybody who listens to this finds this as funny as i do 
what happened was that every day I walked into my studio, I saw vaginas, <laughs> <laughs> open vaginas, and I was uh, horrified. And I was like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And then, but I thought, like, well, if I'm this uncomfortable, I should really do it. Yeah. You know, I should just go on and do this and like open myself up to criticism and, you know, uh, so one painting is really almost a landscape, like, you know, a woman, what is what is threatening about a woman? Mm -hmm. And I think you want to ask a question yeah. about that. Yeah, so, yeah. so I, I have questions about sort of the, the, the two um, that, that yeah. come to mind. Um, a round object has no sharp edge. I, I like that yeah. title. Um, what inspires sort of that that reflection like you know sort of the the duality the the, the being uh being a threat uh, or being perceived as a threat human sexual well, woman female sexuality being perceived as a threat and sort of that duality of being like an object of lust for you know folks and then also being chastised or what have you and it's like you shouldn't but i want that but you shouldn't be, but I want yeah. that. Like, so, so talk about sort of the thinking that and the reasoning, or just why? Why was that of interest? Well, the, uh, the thing is that a uh, uh, round object has no sharp edge is actually like a science term because because if you have a ball, it has no sharp edge because it disappears. Yeah. In, in the in the orb, and uh, you know, women's bodies are seen as a, how the more round the more attractive but at the same time it's perceived as a threat it's like being you you have to hide it you can't show it online every nipple is like an offense uh if you're too sexual you're a slut if you're you know there's so much like harmful that i think that's the most harmful about the human body about the female body is the harm that is projected on it because the body itself is not harmful. It gives life if you're lucky, you know, uh, it gives life, you can enjoy it. Like there's literally nothing harmful about a women's body, but all we do is treat it like something like, I'm, <laughs> I wanted to do this, like a cross. <laughs> like, ah, <laughs> <get away. laughs> like a vampire, no. Ah, women, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it starts in the Bible with Eve and being the temptress. And then, you know, she messes up everything because she wants to know too much. And the women shouldn't know that much because, you know, you don't want to have that power in women's hands. And it's like, it's so, ugh, ugh, it's so cringy if you think about it. And then I was like, every time I walked into the studio and saw that work, I felt ashamed. This is not a lie. Like I felt shame. And I was like, why do I feel ashamed? It's because that's all I've heard ever since I was growing up. And I, I came into my teens is that I had to be ashamed of my body. I had to be ashamed of my behavior. I had to be ashamed of making choices for myself, looking for freedom, uh, for expression, you know, and it's, it's oppressionist. So that's, for me, the painting is freedom, you know? And so I get really like, ugh. I hear you, <laughs> I, I, I like it. Yeah, and, and, um, and uh, the other painting. Uh, slow motion, uh, right? Has, sorry? But the other one you were gonna describe, uh, slow motion? Yeah, slow motion, yeah. You had a question about that as yes. well. So with with this painting is uh, conveying fragility um whirling emotions and uh longing for freedom again freedom is a yeah. freedom's important um how do you use sort of the artistic elements to capture like these emotions within within that piece yeah so it has a jello in it which nobody expected that <laughs> i think until i said it <laughs> that has jello on plates like from a sort of a fifties uh, commercial, and um, and this woman is also very exposed, and her dress is almost, you know, killing her uh, or choking her, or it, it like it, she's wrapped up in it, and it's a whirlwind of fabric, and there are three hands in it, and it feels like somebody said it feels like she's being assaulted, 
but it's not that because she's excited and she maybe wants it, but she also has some kind of distance in her face. And they both the paintings have sort of an ideal beauty in their face, but the face also seems a little bit pasted on because we have this sort of beauty ideal that we all wanna, I say we all as women, I, I can't speak for all women, but a lot of women are like influenced that they have to use a filter when they make a selfie or you mm. want to stay forever young. So this painting is more about this constant, like it, it has a time span, you know, just like those uh, food elements, it, it goes bad really quickly. Yeah can't stay perfect forever it's only perfect for a certain amount of time and mo mostly men say that about women that women don't grow old very nicely uh, men get more handsome is then the saying which is not true <laughs> it's just it depends if you have good genes or not it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman if you have sure. good genes and you take care of yourself you look better you know uh, but then you know, it has a short time span where you're perceived as being beautiful and attractive and it feels so fragile. Like you're always under pressure when you're a woman. And I know, I know I have, I've been pregnant a couple of times, which all failed. And, you know, my time slot is gone already. I don't really want children because if I think about my mom, I'm much too scared that I'm like her. So I, I don't want to have that. So. Uh, but still, you know, it's all these things that as a woman you have to deal with. Yeah. And uh, everybody around you finds it normal that you are under that time pressure. And then uh, men, even friends of mine say, oh, I have time. If I want children, I can just take a younger girlfriend. Or <laughs> and I'm like, dude, what you're saying? It's like, ooh. <laughs> that, that <laughs> so it, yeah, uh, that that was the thing that would 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 come up in in conversations that I I would have, and you know even exploring that that idea. Of, I don't have any kids, but exploring that idea, and you know I was like, I kind of want to hang out with my kid. I don't want to be like fifty and have like a two year old. That's just not my particular vibe or what have you. And no. it's sort of a consideration of like, you know, how how that thing works, and I know it's much harder for for women because you'll hear the thing of well your clock is ticking you don't want to nah, 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 nah. yeah <laughs> this this urgency there that yeah. we, we we don't share in that same sort of i guess biological way or even social way you know society yeah. is like when are you gonna hurry up and have some babies it's like <laughs> i've had a woman once said to me like oh, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> I was like, you don't know why I am missing it. <laughs> so don't say that. <laughs> Dude, it's like, move. <laughs> but, you know, people don't mean to be that, you know, so like that about it. But it's, it is true. And I, I also, you know, I think about man the same, like, you don't want to go with your walking stick if, Son, you want to go baseball? <laughs> Wait, let me get my uh, walking cane. stick. <laughs> Give me 30 minutes and I'll be right with you. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know. I, I, I think it's just, uh, yeah. I had a conversation with a friend of mine who said like that dating women is like transactional, mm. more or less. That he thought if he paid for dinner, then he had the right to have sex. But if she would put out the first night, like he wouldn't date her anymore because then she wouldn't be as valuable. And I was like, oh, my God, we're in the 50s. I'm, I'm in a time machine. What's happening? It's a ridiculous so that, concept that so many yeah. that it, it comes back that it is these faux alpha, all of that stuff. And I think, you know, frankly, what what happens is and it goes back to one of the things you touched on earlier that people aren't communicating of what their their values are and what they actually want. So because things are positioned so often like a transaction, because, you know, some yeah. of the music is like, you should be using guys for these things and these resources and so on. There's some conditioning in that of way. Course. But then people just think like, oh, this is how things work. And I, I think when we get into sort of the mixing of generations and that's another thing, because yeah. I, 
I remember talking with one of my friends and it's like, it's a lot of people who want to be sugar babies that aren't giving out sugar. And I was just like, that's not how that transaction works. Cause we're agreeing to the <laughs> transaction, you know what I mean? But it's, it's, it's a very interesting way that we go yeah. about things. And to the, to the point of the point, I guess we haven't even sorted out like whether we even like each other and how we do some of these things. These are advanced classes, you know, yeah. relationships on dating, on, on sexuality, on sex. And we just kind of like skim through the cliff notes and yeah. just think that, oh, okay, yeah, we're good. We're, we can we can just do this. Now to the advanced courses. You don't know the first level yet. Yeah, no. But I think it all comes down to uh, if you're from an equalist standpoint, it comes down to have respect for one another. Yes. And not expect everything because you think you are somehow higher or better or stronger or you know, if you expect something from somebody else without, you know, it's not a transaction. The transaction should be respect and interest, have an interest in another person, have yeah. questions for somebody instead of judgment, you know, because yeah. a question is so much more interesting. So, I mean, we go beyond now the beauty perspective or you know, a lifespan of uh, attractiveness. I think it's just having interest in each other and having respect, it goes so, so far. It, it just, it will deliver you. It will give you so much more than judgment or, you know, thinking in boxes. Yeah. And have expectations from somebody else that you've set but I'm not necessarily the ones that the other person have, you know, expectations. Yeah. 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 I'm we're on, like I said, we're, we're, you know, right here, just right here. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> um, and, and, and I think sort of my last question, I think I got my last question actually in there. Cause like, like you were saying, you were giving your, you know, your beginning, you were giving, you know, your intro, but here's the funny thing. I always like when people give longer answers because it makes my job easier because I could just start checking off answers, checking off questions, right? It's like, okay, I got that one mm -hmm. answer. Great. So it makes my job easier. So shout out to you. Um, so with that, um, I want to move into sort of the last chunk of the, these these rapid fire questions for you. So yeah. are you ready for these? I don't know. Because, you know. Just... I, hope, I hope so. Let's see. <laughs> so as I tell everybody, and this is going to be a challenge because you know, I think we have a fair amount of similarities. So I don't, you know, I'm going to tell you the same thing I would tell myself. Don't overthink these. Don't uh -huh. overthink. All right. So this can be in whatever language. What is your favorite word? Oh, oh, that's <laughs> ask an ADHD person. Uh, uh, I think psychotic. Okay. When and I and I think I heard it, heard an answer for this in a previous podcast, but I'll just ask you: When do you usually start working during the day? At what time? What part of the day? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, not earlier than eleven in the morning. Okay, but I go on at night most of the time. I mean, it's night there currently, so yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, I, I I noticed this one, so I'm definitely going to ask, what is your favorite Stephen King movie? Oh. I listen. Oh, I, yeah, well, the movie, the favorite Stephen King movie is The Shining, but I know he doesn't like it, but I've read all Stephen King books. Okay. Yeah. I I um I, I didn't put a lot, lot of respect on The Shining initially, and then upon rewatching it and watching the documentary, I think, from 237. Yeah. I was like, yeah. this is amazing. This is great. And yeah, you know, I'm a big Kubrick fan, fan. So, yeah. And I went into seeing Dr. Sleep with that sort of energy. And I was like, this can't, this couldn't be as good, but it's a definitely in a movie that I enjoyed. I, I liked uh, Dr. Sleep as a sort of follow up and a sequel to it, but <laughs> definitely it had an uphill battle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I didn't like Doctor Sleep that much. Oh man. You because I, I don't think I think I think I thought it was too much trying to do the Kubrick thing. But if you're not Kubrick, you should do your own thing. I think. But that's my. I'm. If I, sometimes I just I can't get over my pet peeves. So uh, when they use the same music, 
true. Uh, I thought the music was misplaced sometimes. Yeah. And I thought it was too slow and too heavily on the dramatics and too explanatory, which I don't like. Because that's sometimes something that Stephen King does, that he explains his stories too much. And I like the mystery. So that's what I liked about The Shining, that there was a lot of open to interpretation stuff. And I don't need a further explanation. You know? I, I, that's, that's, that's legit. That's legit. That's legit. That's legit. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. as, a, as a person that also does a movie review podcast, I might have yeah. to have you on to talk some movies. We might have to talk some I movies. Am a, I have seen almost every good movie there is. <laughs> like, I, I binge watch movies, like, but in a good way. Yeah. I know I have one of my best friends is like... A, no, you should watch less and more specific. La, la, la. But he's very, uh, like, very specific. But I have watched a lot of, and a lot of horror. I'm a big horror fan, like a hey. horror fanatic. I'll get into uh, the documentaries and all of that stuff. I have the whole Shutter plan. Watch that pretty regularly. And yeah. Um, yeah. I love A24 films. A24. Yes. Like they call it elevated horror, which I find very pretentious, uh, art horror. But still, I really like the genre, so it's fine by me if they call it like that. Because uh, I think The Witch was one of those A twenty fours, and uh, yep. for yeah. a long time I would just troll and stoker. People. Yeah, I, I would troll people, and I was just like, live deliciously. They're like, stop! <laughs> like, don't don't come to me like that because I don't like goats, right? So when yeah. I was just like, nah. I don't like this. This is this is some pagan shit. I don't like it. I ain't really with it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's the church. Hereditary. Hereditary is also Look. really good. Um, <laughs> so many. Yeah. Heads yeah. off to that. Have me, on, have me on your movie podcast as well. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so this, this is the last one I got for you. Um, a rapid fire question. And um, it can only be one sentence. All right. So keep this in mind. What would you say to Delight Delirio? Oh, that's my. Uh, <laughs> what would you say to uh, your younger, my... pretentious self? Oh my God, that was my pretentious street art name. <laughs> 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 I would like to say, like, you can do this right now, but you'll get over yourself. <laughs> Uh, I, I definitely was super excited to add that. I thought you'd get a kick out of it. Um, yeah, yeah, because I know I, I remember when I at, at exhibitions, I had to introduce myself. <laughs> and uh, when you shake someone's hand and you're saying you're delighted delirium, you learn pre pretty quickly to use your own name. You know, <laughs> you get over it really fast. <laughs> it's so I funny. Mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely I had to I had to choose early on, like in my the beginning of my whole podcast thing. I, you know, my initial radio name was Rob Good Times. And I was like, that doesn't it's not gonna last. It's not gonna last, my boy. You sound like a gigolo. I, it, it, I, I do. I do. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it wasn't going to be yeah. a long term sort of sort of fit. So I just went with a shortened version of my actual real name. So and that's yeah. what it is. And yeah. Yeah. So I like it. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so that is pretty much it for today's um, conversation. But um, two things. Um, one, I want to thank you for coming on. We, we got it. You know, we had this time. And this has been great. I want to yeah. thank you for coming on. And, and two, I want to invite and encourage you to share with the listeners any details, you know, you got the show coming up, website, social media, anything you want to share in these final moments, the floor is yours. Okay, well, you can find my work at martinajohanna.com. It will probably be somewhere in the podcast description. And um, you're welcome to visit uh, the show. The show opens in Hashimoto Contemporary in LA the 13th of January, and I will be there. Uh, as well. And also, I will be uh, doing a residency in New York in, this, in the spring summer. So I'll be living in America for just two and a half months. But it's awesome. So uh, and, and I'm going to be exhibiting then as well, probably. I'll have to see. But uh, yeah, that's it. And uh, check out my work. I hope you guys like it. And if not, it's okay too. 
I'm open to anything. <laughs> and there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Martin Johanna for coming on to the pod. And um, I'm Rob Lee saying that there's art, culture, and community in and around your neck of the woods. You've just got to look for it. Oh,